And this week, a uh, very special guest. He is a former Valley Viking, where he started in basketball and football, currently playing for the University of New Mexico Lobos. But his story really just begins there. He might just be the most interesting man on campus. Titan Saltis <laughs> is my guest. Where, uh, where do we begin, man? You do so much. I guess I want to start with... Uh, your recent trip with the Save the Children Action Network. Can right. you fill us in on that? Yeah. Um, so, like, Save the Children Action Network is the political voice for children. Um, and so what we did, what I did, is I, repre I represent the, the organization. We went up to Washington, D.C. for a few days for a youth summit, and then uh, we actually got to lobby for a bill for, for, for children, um, for early child care development and things like that. So we were actually up there meeting with, you know, congressional reps. I met with Deb Holland, uh, Sharice Davis. I even got to see, you know, uh, Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer and like the House Speaker. Um, and we were up there and we were really advocating for, for change for children. And, um, you know, it was a fun time. It was great to see. I, I got to walk the halls of, of Congress. I got to actually go underneath the Capitol and in the tunnels where people don't get to go because I was there on, you know, official business. Right. <laughs> so it, it, was, it was pretty cool. Now, most folks would say that uh, children's voice in politics, that's an oxymoron, right? Exactly. How do children get a voice exactly. in that, policy making and politics? Right, and that's, what, and that's what we're here for, the Save the Children Action Network, because, you know, children are often the most voiceless and the most powerful, the pow powerless when it comes to politics. You know, they can't vote, so nobody's going to pay attention to them. But if you throw enough money towards uh, lobbying and really getting ad advocates into Congress, speaking with their elected officials, um, and is really pressuring our elected officials through these big programs like Save the Children, who have been around for, I think, 100 years or so. Um, when, you have, when you have that political power, that backing behind you, then, you know, your elected officials begin to pay attention. Then they begin to, oh, shoot, I really got to do something about this. Or if they don't do it, then that's when we really show the people like, you know, they're not for the children, they're not for this, for that. And that's what, that's what we do when we lobby. And, you know, we're there to fight for our children. And when we have these huge organizations that are able to come in and, and really, really back us and give us a voice, that in turn give children a voice, um, our elected officials, they pay attention. And, and, and they do care. You know, the, a, lot of, a lot of politicians get uh, very like, negative connotations towards them. Um, and why they, do you think that is? Because of politics, um, and you know, is it as simple as they don't vote, so I don't care about them? Or no, is that an not necessarily. It's it's. I mean, politics is complicated, but at the same time, it, it's kind of it's simple. Um, they politicians pay attention to who vote, um, because you know, all I think it's all about being reelected. They're always thinking about the next election. How can I? How what can I do to get reelected? And they want to stay in there. Um, you know the the incumbency rate for uh, uh, um, income in, in incumbents. Um, I think it's like ninety five percent in the house, and, um, and so once they get in, they want to stay in, and they do stay in. In order to do that, they got to pay attention to their voters, the ones that actually show out and vote. Like I said, children they can't vote, but um, po money in politics is huge, um, and like with organizations like Save the Children. We can come in and um, we have the money and we have the political power to really pressure 
our, our representatives into paying attention to, to our children and crafting policy and legislation that, that really caters towards making, making a better, better country and a better future for our children. Um, you know, politicians, they, like I said, they have a bad rep, but um, a lot, a lot of, they do care. They really do. They care about children. So what would be an example of some of that policy? Where, where does the, the Children Action Network, where do, they, where do they stand on the policy spectrum? What kind of policies are, are they pushing? Right. Um, so Save the Children is completely bipartisan. Right. Um, so they, they, they endorse um, Republicans and, and Democratic candidates, not just in Congress, um, but they do local elections, like state elections, um, your midterm elections, um, gov you know, governors, things like that. So they're, they're in every level of, of government endorsing whatever policies towards children. Um, so, for, so for example, we were up there um, fighting for a House bill that we want them to get passed, which um, would expand funding towards t early child care development um, that would really not just expand, but create new, new quality child care centers for children and make it more affordable for, for mothers and, and, and fathers who are trying to go to school and try to and also have children and they can't afford to, um, they can't afford to do both, you know, an interesting fact that I found out while I was while I was up in D.C. Um, one year of, of of child care for one child costs more than one year of tuition at almost every public college throughout wow. the country, right? And we don't talk about that very much. Right. Not a lot of people know that. And so you know, ima you imagine, you know, you're a young parent trying to go to school, trying to educate yourself, make yourself better, and make give your child a better future, but you. You can't. It's hard to pay for college, and put your child into childcare because you know they got to work also. Um, so what do you do then? You know it, it's hard, and it's even hard to even get your child into into these childcare programs because you know some of them have like two to three year waiting waiting list. So you gotta you gotta get on the waiting list before you even have a kid. You know just to just to make sure you're going in the right track. Um, and, th and this is just one example of, of the many things that Save the Children does. Um, they also do international work, but you know the program, the organization, everything is all about the child and how we can do things that give each child, regardless of their upbringing or race or ethnicity or whether they're an American or whether they're Russian or from the Middle East, regardless of who it is, a child is a child. And we want to make sure that we give every single child the best opportunity that we can to, to have a successful life. Where did your interest in public policy and policy making, where did that begin? I've always been, I've always been interested in politics. Um, I guess it would start it from my family. Um, and you know, before, before it was politics and government and this and that, it was always the youth. You know, I, grew, I was raised in a family that always put children first and we've always, we've always, you know, did everything that we can to help, not just children, but help as many people as we can. You know, as I got older and I started to understand more about the change-making process, um, I started to realize that politics is important, especially for, for underrepresented people like Native Americans or, or blacks or Hispanics or, you know, minority people in general. We have a Congress that's supposed to represent all of America. But when we look at Congress, when we look at the presidency, when we look at the you know officials, they don't look like me, they don't talk like me, they don't they're not from where I'm from. They don't understand, or they haven't seen the things that we see, and so that representation isn't there for us. Um, and you know another big thing that I want to go to is in in law, because a lot of a lot of a lot of issues that that plague our communities. Um, deal with the law. We'll have, we'll have to go into law, go into the courtroom to battle, to fight these battles, to, to win, um, to put our people forward. Um, and so I start to realize that we, we need more people that look like me, that talk like me, people who can, who, like me, who can represent an entire community that has never been represented. You know, have, they never had a seat at the table. Um, and so you, I, I figured if nobody else is going to do it, then maybe Maybe I'll be the one to step up and, and, and try to try to move myself in that direction, and, and in turn showing 
my own people that that we can all do it if we just put our minds to it it's something that we can all achieve so we're going to take our first time out here we're going to talk more public policy dive into some uh keynote speech that you just gave recently that really piqued my interest that and much more with teton salties right here on local focus what is glamour frailty what is desire diamonds they say a life lived without passion is hardly worth living ma'am 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 dang this one made me feel all special The New Mexico High School Coaches Association, established in 1941, is an organization of New Mexico's best and most professional interscholastic coaches. Coaches across work daily to help our student athletes excel in the classroom, on the field of play, and in our communities. Students that participate in interscholastic activities attain higher grades, higher graduation rates, and higher wages. Responsible for the North-South All-Star Games, statewide coaches award program, and providing multiple professional development opportunities for New Mexico's coaches. Be a great coach by coaching beyond the game. The Albuquerque Dragway is a proud sponsor of ProView Networks. Visit abqdragway.com for directions and a full event schedule. Don't sacrifice quality of flavor when you're in a hurry. Golden Pride offers ribs, fried chicken, green and red chili breakfast burritos, and Frontier Cinnabons. Four great locations or visit us online at goldenfried at abq.com. Golden Fried Barbecue Chicken and Ribs, proud supporter of Proview Sports Network. Well, I'm going to the frontier, walk to the cashier, order up a root beer and a number one. Cover it with green stuff, one scoop is not enough. Find a booth is real tough, back by the Duke. Meet my family, meet my friends in the quirkiest restaurant I have ever been. All of Albuquerque's favorite spot, it's the Frontier Restaurant. The Frontier Restaurant is a proud supporter of ProView Sports Network. Back with UNM linebacker Teton Salties. Uh, a man so interesting that we're not even going to get to that on this show. <laughs> Trust me, we're not. Okay? So let's pick up kind of where we left off. Um, <clears throat> public policy. Right. Why are people underrepresented? Whether it's by gender, by race, by uh, in, the, in the Save the Children Action Network uh, area, by uh, age, obviously. Why, why are young people, let's start there, why are young people underrepresented? Uh, well, how young are we talking? Well, I mean, I always think... People that aren't of voting age mm -hmm. tend to be underrepresented right. for obvious reasons. If, yeah, for obvious reasons, they can't they can't vote. Right. Um, it's it's a difficult situation because politicians they they only pay attention to who vote. Well, I won't say only, but for the most part, they only pay attention to to who's going to cast a ballot for them because ultimately they want to get reelected. Um, do you think young people scare the hell out of politicians? I do. I do. And let me tell yes. you why. I, I think so because. Because they tend to be more issues voters, right? And uh, that the politicians don't like that. That's not comfortable. Right. So they're not easier to corral and, and rein in uh, when when I think uh, chil or children or you know that 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 18 right before you turn a voting age. Right. They tend to be more uh, maybe single issue voters, couple of issue voters. They're not as party driven yet. Absolutely. I think that scares the hell out of politicians. And it should. You know, we we've seen within this last election. Uh, the last midterms, this, this big, huge blue wave of, of young voters that, that came out and, 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 and voted at, and showed up at the polls. Um, you know, politicians, today, today we're seeing young voters move away from this polarization, this partisanship, more so where they're really, like you said, in, instead of voting with, uh, you know, Democrat or Republican, they're really pushing issues, you know, abortion, um, Healthcare, you know, things like that, um, and we and we've seen with like the Bernie Sanders thing, where I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. But young voters 
if they don't get what they want, they they won't they won't even you know like for for example Hillary Clinton, she didn't she didn't win because a lot of the Bernie supporters refused to support Hillary, and so you know we and we see this in Congress with um, for example like Alexandria Ocasio Cortez and these these new progressives that are coming into Congress, even within their own party they're 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 scaring their own party, you know the AOCs are are kind of tearing apart the Democratic Party when it comes to like the the establishment Democrats like like Nancy Pelosi for example there's a lot of bickering and fighting going you know inter party re, uh, relationship there's a lot of a lot of fighting going in um, and I think it scares the older the older um, politicians because they see this 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 movement this wave that is that is stepping up of, of young people that are that are starting to show out that are starting to vote that are starting to to really um, Organize and, and and come out and show up at the polls, and they're starting to really get their voices heard by politicians. Um, and so I, I I think I think it scares them a lot. Well, we kind of talked off camera here during the break a little bit about the whole the blind uh, party loyalty. And, right. Uh, so uh, you know I think Bernie Sanders supporters are, were not willing to blindly support Hillary, right? Right. Especially after how Bernie lost the primary. Right. Uh, that's a good thing for politics, though, isn't it? I that think there so. is no blind loyalty to a candidate or a party. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I, ideally, there should be no parties, and that's how our founding fathers, the the framers of the Constitution, intended our for our politics, our government system to work. Is no, we, you know, there was no parties, and you know, just think about how much we can accomplish today if there were no parties. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I, you know, there's one funny thing that I, I always. I learned from one of my professors and was talking about Obamacare. Um, and there was Republicans that they knew the name Obamacare, they didn't know it by the Affordable Care Act. And so they were doing polls and they were saying, would you support Obamacare? And all the Republicans, no, o <laughs> Obama, no, you know? <laughs> and then they came back and said, well, would you support the Affordable Care Act? And they said, oh, well, yeah, for sure. And, you know, it, it helps me a lot. It, you know, it does this for me. It does that. And really that goes to show how polarized things are today, that, you know, we know how people are going to vote. We know how they think just based off of their, their, um, their, part, their party identification, their party ID, because nowadays ideology and identif party ID, you know, they go together. If you're a Republican, you're you're conservative. If you're liberal, you're Democrat. It wasn't always that way. You know, there was a lot of people in between back in the day, and there's a lot of party sorting, but, you know, I don't want to get into that. It's kind of boring. Right, <laughs> right. Uh, I want to pull out a quote from your keynote speech that you actually quoted Frederick Douglass. It's right. easier to build strong children than to repair broken men. So I want to go back to your childhood. Sure. How did your parents build such a strong young man? Through example. Um, they showed me, they didn't just tell me how to be a good person. They didn't just tell me that you need to do this in order to help them and do this to become smart. And They showed me through example. They brought me with them whenever they went out and did the things that they did were helping people. Um, they showed me the power of an education because everybody in my family is educated. They weren't, you know, I don't, I don't come from a rich family or anything of that of that sort, but I come from an educated family. Um, and that's the most powerful thing because children watch. Children, they see you every day, whether you, whether you know it or not, whether you're paying attention. Children look up to you as adults and they follow you. Um, you know, my family really instilled those, those values within me. Um, you know, everything we did was all about helping people, doing good in the world, and 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 leaving your mark in, in a positive way, helping as many people as you can along your way. Um, you know, my I've I've been blessed to have an incredible support system from my family, that unfortunately not a lot of people where I'm from, they don't they don't have that same support system. And I really think that's that's the biggest thing that really sets you up for whether you're going to succeed in life or whether you're going to fail is that support you know because like I said we didn't always have all the we didn't have all the money in the world or anything like that but I, I had a great support system that that really 
help me help to elevate myself and you know like my brother and all of us we they showed us they gave us that that drive that passion to want to do good in the world and to to strive to to, to go as far as we can and never look back i want to squeeze in one more thing before we go to break here um we have a mutual friend uh coach dominic bramante of the gladiators right and um so he's real big on um What's the legacy you're going to leave behind? And he always says, you know, now that he's, I don't know how he phrased it, I think he calls it the downslope. Now that he's on the downslope uh -huh. of his life, uh, those things become more important to him, what he leaves behind, what legacy he leaves behind. It seems like you're there at a very, very early stage in your life. You're already leaving a legacy, trying to leave the world a better place at a very young age where maybe, you know, Coach talks about doing it now as he gets ready to, you know, go towards the latter stages of his life. When, I mean, is that, did that just come naturally to you? I mean, when, when did you decide, hey, leaving this place a better place than, it, than I got it was important to you? Um, like I said, at least from my family. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good question. I don't, I don't know when it really struck me, but I guess, you know, grow, I grew up on the reservation and it's the poorest place in the country. I've, I've seen my, my own people struggle and then I come out here and I just see all the struggle and, and the pain within the world. And my, you have to see, obviously, that not my, everyone your age is legacy building right now, right? Sure. You know, but I don't go into it thinking I'm going to build my legacy. I'm just doing what I think is right. What I, I'm doing what I think is necessary to, to really move, move my generation forward in, in, a, in, a, in a positive way, in a good way. Um, you know, I think that's the best way you can approach something like that, is you have to truly be genuine about what you do and what you say. And when you do that, and when you accomplish what you set out to do, that's when the legacy comes. But like I said, I'm not necessarily setting out to, I'm gonna do this to make sure my legacy is cemented or anything like that. I'm not even, you know, thinking about right. that. <laughs> right. I just, I just wanna be able to help as many people as I can and do good in the world. We're going to take our final time out and come right back with Teton Salties. Dream Style Remodeling has been wowing homeowners in New Mexico since 1989. Selected as Best Custom Home Remodeler for three consecutive years by readers of the Albuquerque Journal, we're also your exclusive provider for top home improvement brands like Renewal by Anderson, Four Seasons, Blaze King, and many others. Founded and headquartered in Albuquerque, Dream Style Remodeling is family-owned and now employs more than 500 people across the southwestern U.S. In fact, we've helped more than 60,000 homeowners improve their home in New Mexico, Arizona, California, Idaho, and West Texas. We're committed to providing a superior customer experience. We've earned 4.6 stars with hundreds of online reviews and have an A-plus with the BBB. DreamStyle Remodeling is a proud supporter of UNM Athletics. Visit our beautiful 10,000-square-foot showroom at 1460 Renaissance Boulevard across from Sam's Club or DreamStyleRemodeling.com to make your home remodeling dreams come true. <laughs> Back with uh, UNM linebacker Teton Salties, recently gave a keynote speech at Santa Fe Indian School. Uh, just tell us a little bit about that and then I have some questions. Yeah, um, so they invited me there. They were doing a, the, senior, the senior class for getting ready to graduate. Um, one of their final projects was a, a senior uh, keynote symposium. Um, and it was, I think it was, it was a culmination of a one to two year research project that they've been doing, um, and they went and presented all day long to whoever showed up. You know, I, I, I went there and first of all, I was blown away by the, not just how many students did the projects, but um, what the projects really were. They weren't just like simple research projects or, when you read some of the things that they were researching and, and looking for, it, it was powerful because it was actual solutions to fixing many of the, the, the issues that plague, you know, their homes, their reservations, um, are on or off the reservation, just the country in general. And these are these are young high school students talking about, you know, bringing renewable energy and resources back to their reservation so they can focus on being self-sustainable, um, 
you know, looking back to their ancestors and, and, and you know, their, their traditional ways to, to help cure and heal sicknesses within their communities. And, you know, you know, it goes on and on, but it was incredible to see these young people and it inspired me with my speech that I wrote and I want to inspire them in turn. And so, you know, while I was there, the, the speech that I, that I wrote was really a call to action for the young people that you're never young enough to, you're not, you know, you're not too young to create change, to inspire change within your community and within yourself. Um, you know, one thing I tell, and I also talk to the adults in there, and I tell them, the, you know, the, the worst thing we can do is tell a young person that they're too young to inspire change. You know, they're, they're not, we, we, we shouldn't tell children or young people that they're the future of the country because they're not the future of the country. They're the reality of it today. And, you know, what they do, what they, what they say is important today. Um, and they can inspire change, whether, you know, how big or how small is up to them. But it was really a, a call to, to, uh, to, to, to be good people and, do the best they can to to change their communities. And uh, I mean, I picked out a few. You kind of touched on a couple of the projects that I jotted down, but I think so many of them, and you, you can uh, tell me if you agree or disagree here, but so many of these kind of all tie into upward economic mobility. Right. Especially when it comes to the reservation, right? Whether, whether it's water sovereignty or um, the renewable energy piece. Yep. Um, I think... Uh, I think there was something in there about uh, not having a reliance on gaming, things like that. Uh, can you speak to that? Can you speak to the uh, economic? Uh, I mean, how impressed were you? I guess you, guess you mentioned it already, yeah. but but um, these are all solutions, right? So right. I mean, it was delve into some of them. It was inc it was incredible to mm -hmm. see. You know, like like you said, the big one of the big uh, topics, you know, they surrounded was was uh, ec economics. You know, reservations are supposed to be or tribes. Um, federally recognized tribes were supposed to be sovereign nations within the United States. But, you know, the biggest, the, one of the biggest key factors to being a sovereign nation is being economically dependent or independent, um, being able to sustain yourself. And right now, the reservation systems can't do it. Why not? There's no, there's no economics. And, you know, like, I, I can't necessarily speak for every reservation, sure. but my reservation in general, um, there is no economy really. It's completely stagnant. You know, new businesses will try to come, but it, they you know they fail because there's there's just no there's no money flow. There's there's just nothing there for them. There's no incentive for them to even come in and try to establish a a business there. You know, my brother actually opened up a burger joint on the reservation, so that's a a great step for us to move forward. But you know, going back to the economy. There is no, there's nothing there. You know, all the money that we get um, is all federally funded. You know, the government gives that, gives us that, that money. Um, and, you know, sure, we have some things that we make money off of, like a casino, but the casino barely breaks even every year. You know, some some reservations have huge casinos that generate like billions of sure. dollars, but that's like five five tribes out of I think there's 538 rec federally recognized tribes. So we don't. There's we can't lean on that as a solution. Well, I was going to ask about that. I've I've heard some, I've heard some people tell me that 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 this reliance on gaming is dangerous. It is. Yeah. Can you speak to that? Yeah. I mean, in order to be successful in gaming, it, it's all about where you're at, location within the tribe. So these huge, money-making tribes are like the Seminoles in Florida, or um, up in I think in Minnesota. Or, where they have these huge populations, or, or even here, uh, you know, the Sandia Casino. Albuquerque is a huge city, there's a lot of traffic flow. So they, they have the, the means to be successful in tribal gaming. But all the other tribes, like mine, for example, which is in the middle of nowhere in, in South Dakota, you know, right. <laughs> not a lot of people are gonna be driving through South Dakota, let alone a reservation in South Dakota. Um, it's, not a good, it's not a good way for us to to uh, to go forward with with tribal gaming, and it doesn't help us. Truth, truthfully, my tribe, it doesn't help us. Um, so we have to look towards other things. And for example, one thing would be, we live on the plains. There's a lot of wind. There's a lot of sun. We can get solar farms or or, or wind, you know, and we can really um, 
generate our own electricity. We could do things like that that um, will move us closer to being independent and sovereign. Um, and it'll give us the means to really do a lot more things that, that, that we've been wanting to do um, and to really um, express that sovereignty that, that, that we have. So. Well, we're uh, sadly already out of time here, so we didn't get to a lot of what I wanted to talk. A lot of I what know. I wanted to talk about, <laughs> but um, oh, by the way, you're really good at football. <laughs> and, Maybe. Uh, yeah. and so, uh, hopefully, uh, whether you're playing on Saturdays or Sundays, right. uh, you'll be able to use that uh, to continue to push out a very bright and loud and intelligent voice right here in our own community. Right. Thanks a lot for uh, joining us and. Uh, by the way, that's a Lobo you definitely want to go support. Thanks, T-Town, for coming in, and Thank thanks you. for joining us.